Welcome again to today's webinar. We are going to be discussing why DevSecOps is broken without runtime observability. I'm Amy Fenwick, I'm the Director of Marketing and you'll hear my voice hop in and out throughout the presentation. Just wanna give you guys a couple of reminders. Um, all attendees have been muted. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording. And lastly, don't forget to take our survey at the very end. And with that, I will turn it over to our CEO, Kieran Kameny. Kieran can go through our speakers and the rest of the presentation. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Amy. Welcome, everyone. Um, today we have a power packed panel, um, a, a bunch of high IQ and EQ folks in the, in the, in the panel today. We have uh, Neil Daswani. He, uh, is one of those uh, unique practitioners who has both an academic and a practitioner background. He was former CISO at uh, Symantec in the Consumer BU, and he is the director of the Stanford's uh, cybersecurity program. And he's also a book author, and he's recently written a book called Big Breaches, which uh, is going to be released uh, pretty quickly. And in fact, even before release, it's already one of the top 100 bestsellers in, uh, on, on Amazon. Uh, welcome, Neil. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, Karen, for having me. Looking forward to the session today. Awesome. And Mike Larkin, he's uh, the co-founder CT of DeFactor. He is the father of the OpenBSD hypervisor. So uh, he, he wrote the hypervisor from the ground up for OpenBSD, so that's a, that's a massive feat. Uh, he's also an entrepreneur. Uh, he's, uh, he and I had done a company called GreenCube Technologies, which was acquired by Citrix uh, almost a decade ago. And uh, he's for the last 20 years, a guest faculty at San Jose State University, teaching the master's students, uh, you know, one or two courses uh, uh, every session. So uh, welcome, Mike. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thanks, Karen. Awesome. So today, the topic is to talk about DevSecOps, why we're seeing such a massive interest and in rise in, in the area of DevSecOps, and then talk about observability as the next phase of uh, you know, key technical innovation in the area of DevSecOps that is, that uh, helps us do DevSecOps right, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as an enterprise. So let's start with Neil. Neil, why don't you, I mean, uh, your background is really interesting. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what it, how, how has it been for you as a, both a chief security officer at an organization like Symantec at the same time, you know, teaching at Stanford and writing a book, like you, it's, it's, it's a very unique background. So we'd love to hear about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for asking, Kieran. You know, let me, let me first start off by mentioning that, uh, you know, my entire career has been in cybersecurity and I've been in a variety of roles. I uh, have been a security entrepreneur. I, you know, used to work at Google. I went off and co-founded a company called uh, Dacient after that time where we were identifying, you know, malicious ads and ad networks and getting those uh, removed um, in very automated systematic ways. Um, you know, I've also spent some time working at Twitter. Uh, after that, I uh, spent some time as a chief information security officer uh, at both uh, LifeLock and Semantics uh, Consumer Business Unit. And I, I, so I've been both on the buying side where you have to assemble a comprehensive information security program. I've been on the entrepreneur side where I've, you know, built some of the tools that are, are required for say large social media companies. Um, and I've also just throughout that time served as uh, co-director of Stanford's uh, advanced cybersecurity program, which, you know, at different points in my career that the program needs, uh, you know, more attention or less attention, uh, depending upon what's going on. I have been giving that program more attention over the past uh, year and a half together with uh, Dan Bonet and John Mitchell uh, at Stanford. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I thought would be important to focus on going forward is now that there's been seven years worth of big breaches and, you know, uh, there, there's been a whole bunch of startups also, uh, I thought it'd be important to, to write a book about what are the key things we can learn about the root causes of these breaches and how do we get to a state, like what are the technologies that are really gonna matter with regards to having fewer breaches going forward. And so that, that's really a little bit about, uh, you know, the different angles I've seen in, in my background and, uh, you know, glad to bring that together in a, in a, in a book now uh, that, uh, you know, made the top 100 in the computer hacking 
category even before it's been launched. Uh, you know, in um, you know, which will be launched in just a few weeks in, in March. Yeah, it's a pretty big feat. We're all looking forward to the book. I pre-ordered it. <laughs> Glad to have customers. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. And uh, let's switch to Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, you've uh, you've had an extremely interesting background yourself as an entrepreneur, as a as a faculty at San Jose State University, as the author of one of the popular uh, you know modules of of the OpenBSD hypervisor. So. Uh, you know, take us a little bit uh, through your background as well, especially, you know, touch upon, you know, over the last couple of years, especially uh, as, as you and I embarked upon this journey of, of uh, yeah, building Deep Factor, um, you know, in, in that context, it would be great to give, uh, for you to give some color on what led you to, uh, you know, join with me and start up Deep Factor. Great. As you mentioned, uh, you and I have done a company before, and for those attendees who aren't familiar with the company that Kieran and I started previously, it was essentially a virtualization company. Uh, it was a uh, essentially container runtime, if you will, for Windows, but it was years and years before anyone was doing containers. Uh, so essentially we built a virtualization company back then, as Kira mentioned, sold that to Citrix. Uh, I myself, I'm a systems level programmer. I'm a low level guy. Um, so when Kieran came to me with an idea for doing security, uh, the, the, the question that he posed was, do you think we could develop a piece of software that would allow developers to add one line of code to their to their application and you know get security in air quotes. And I remember saying, you know, that we can actually do one better. We can do it in zero lines of code. And I think through the course of today's discussion, we'll, we'll show you how that works. It's actually pretty a, a pretty powerful technique. So no code changes to be able to get security insights for your application. Um, as Kieran mentioned, I I've written the OpenBSD hypervisor, and actually back at Ringcube, we wrote we wrote one as well. And I wrote another one, so actually well versed in that area as well, having written three of them. Uh, and as Kieran mentioned, I've been teaching at San Jose State in the software engineering master's program for almost 20 years now. I teach uh, software security, uh, operating systems, virtualization, cloud computing, and, and a bunch of other classes. So awesome. great to be great to be here. Awesome, awesome. Now that's uh, both of you got obviously fantastic uh, you know, backgrounds. So let's let's switch to Neil. You know, let's talk about the rise of DevSecOps. So we've been seeing a lot of uh, noise in that area uh, lately. I is it fluff? Is it is it real? I mean, is is the uh, is it just another buzzword, or is there something in DevSecOps that the industry needs to know about? Sure. So DevSecOps is um, deeply, deeply needed. There's been two forces in the market that has resulted in the deep need for. Uh, the DevSecOps model. The first is that there is continuing pressure from the market, from organization, from companies, um, and, and from their users and customers to continue delivering more features and functionality um, as fast as possible. Uh, those that win in the market are those that get the new stuff out first. Um, at the same time, we have seen over the past 15 years that there has been over 9,000 reported data breaches. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of mega breaches and a number of these both mega breaches and reported breaches have been due to software vulnerabilities. Um, so, you know, if you look at breaches at uh, Capital One, at Facebook, at uh, Equifax, they're, they're all due to software vulnerabilities in a variety of ways. I'd be happy to chat a little bit more about all those, but, um, if you're moving too fast, you can end up introducing vulnerabilities in your code or missing vulnerabilities in your code that can result in a fairly massive data breach. So what DevSecOps does is it's a model where we don't have to develop software in the old siloed way where you develop something, then you test it, then you uh, do some formal regression testing, et cetera, um, and, and have these gates, but rather, in if you approach the DevSecOps model right, then you can have continuous monitoring and continuous observability of your software security such that you can deliver both the speed as well as the security that today's applications require. Got it, got it. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Now, um, there's this shift in the market from uh, you know, the previous generation of ops people trying to secure the infrastructure, which is still essential, 
but now there's this thinking about, hey, I need to build secure applications to start with, as opposed to completely throwing it on the ops people and say, you know what, the app is, app is what it is, but you guys protect the infrastructure, put firewalls in place, et cetera. But, but what we're noticing with the sophistication, increased sophistication of breaches today is that even if you put a firewall, if you protect your perimeter uh, properly and your infrastructure properly, if you don't write your app properly, if it's not secure at the source, then chances are you are going to get breached, right? Yeah, that is exactly right. So the, the cloud providers um, can help secure the infrastructure for you, but you are still responsible for the security of your own applications. And you know, to just bring up some example past breaches, in the Capital One breach, there was a server-side request forgery vulnerability that was taken advantage of. In um, the Equifax, Equifax vulnerability, uh, you know, breach, there was a unpatched Apache strut server that everybody kind of knows was taken advantage of. But by the way, there was also SQL injection vulnerabilities taken advantage of there as well, which is not as widely known. And if you look at one of the Facebook breaches from 2018, the, the view uh, you know, profile as vulnerability, uh, there were three pretty sophisticated vulnerabilities that came together um, that resulted in that. So you've got to, you've got to, you know, keep these in mind uh, because big breaches can occur due to software vulnerabilities. Right. And what does it mean in, the, in, the, in this day then um, from a role of AppSec perspective? Is AppSec no longer required because people are, uh, you know, find, dev teams are trying to find and fix and create more secure applications to begin with? Or is the apps, the AppSec team more important now because they need to set the right framework of the right tools uh, in place so that the dev teams can actually uh, get that continuous feedback about whether they have introduced any security compliance related risks in their applications? Yes, very good question. So if you look at the way, if you look at what AppSec teams used to do 10, 15 years ago, they used to spend a lot of their time doing the security design reviews, doing the code reviews, um, you know, doing the work to find the vulnerabilities and then working with development teams to fix them. And I think that the realization is that if you want AppSec to succeed, given that there's many, many more developers then there are AppSec people. Um, if you want to have a scalable approach towards secure software development, if you want to have a scalable approach to DevSecOps, one thing the application security teams can do is view their role as putting the frameworks and putting the monitoring in place such that the developers can help themselves and can fix issues that get identified by the frameworks that are that are put in place. And I think that's the more the more modern view of where AppSec teams should be putting more focus. Yeah, I like how you mentioned in our last one of our conversations, uh, the Jedi and the Clone Warrior uh, example. Yes, yes, yes. So since there are very few application security folks, very security, very few security folks in general, one way to think about it is that, you know, the, the application security uh, folks, they are they are they are the Jedi's. They um, are masters of their art. Uh, they're masters of lightsaber duels. They're uh, masters of strategy. Um, but there are not enough Jedi to defend the galaxy. There is no way that the Jedi could have won the Clone War if it were not for all of the lieutenants and generals and the the, the huge infantry, right? And so, if, if you look at the kind of programs that AppSec teams have set up. They set up programs where, for instance, they, they not only help roll out, roll out the frameworks that should be used to achieve security, but what they do is they will uh, help train um, and nominate local security czars in each and every development team, and then correspond and, and work with them to, to achieve security. So I think that is a, a much, more, much more scalable model. And by the way, I think that every developer can be a can be a Jedi too. Um, it, it, it basically if um, you know that that local securities are uh, you know it's great to have that person be the local Jedi who can use the frameworks and you know help identify and fix the vulnerabilities and or reach out to the central AppSec team uh, whenever needed. Yeah, yeah, totally. Let's let's switch over to Mike for a second. Mike, um, you know DevSecOps. The industry moving from DevOps to DevSecOps is something that, you know, as, as Neil talked about as well, is a solid trend, a, a solid necessity in the enterprise. Now, in the world of DevSecOps, we've had a bunch of tools in the past. 
you know, mostly scanning type tools, which look at a, you know, the analogy is you know, the current tools that we have, you know, are scanning and code scanning and image scanning and whatnot. They look at parked, a parked car. Um, observability, which is the next phase of innovation in the world of DevSecOps is helping us look at the running car, a running application. So let's talk about how observability fits in to uh, in the in the world of uh, DevSecOps and why uh, it's important. Sure. And if you want to build this one out, Kieran, um, as, as Kieran mentioned, we've had uh, tools that have done uh, various types of scanning for a, a very long time. Uh, you can even go back as far as you know linters from the 1970s, as far as being able to look at a piece of code and try to guess at whether or not there's going to be problems. And those evolved into more and more advanced tools as time progressed. But if you look at some of just the traditional classic um, static code analysis tools, uh, these are these are probably you know, 10, 15 years old at this point. And they do do a fairly good job at detecting things that, that, are, that are pretty common. You know, for example, you're using an API that a library has marked as been being deprecated or something like that. Or you've used, um, you've used a variable without initializing it. You know, these, these, kinds of, these kinds of problems are catchable by those, by those tools. But they're, they're looking at a different part of the security of, this, of the, the DevSecOps pipeline. And that's typically done from, from the developer at their workstation or maybe part of the, the check-in process. Those tools will report back on various things that, are, um, that, that may be wrong with your code. Of course, the next phase is actually at the build time when the application is assembled from all of its constituent parts, which by the way, the developer may have brought in from who knows where. Uh, that is when you have tools that do uh, software composition analysis. You know, is this module, is this jar file or is this NPM module you're bringing in uh, have you know known vulnerabilities in it. So at build time and at compile time and at or very very early developer time, we have these tools that have been around for you know a decade or more. But once the application leaves that build phase, uh, you end up going into test, and then the application might change its behavior based on different kinds of inputs. So any application that changes its behavior based on parameters or inputs that are presented to it. Uh, can change their behavior in a way that a static code analysis tool might not be able to find. And let's face it, that's basically the definition of every piece of software ever written, a piece of software that changes its behavior based on input. So for example, if your application steers one direction if a particular function is invoked or steers a different direction if a different function is invoked, might bring in this library or that library or the other library, one of the things that is important to look at is how is the application actually behaving as it's running. So you need to be inside the car using Kieran's analogy to be able to look at the dashboard and see all the gauges and everything and see what, what is actually going on rather than just looking at the car parked in the parking lot turned off. Um, of course, looking at the car from the parking lot with it turned off can tell you if a tire is missing or something obvious like that, but it's not going to tell you if the engine's running rough or if the, you know, if you're, if you're low on oil or, or whatnot. Uh, one of the things I like to tell my students actually in the security program at San Jose State is, um, even if you write perfect code, and, and I'm interested to get Neil's opinion on this as well, even if you write perfect code, even if I show you all the code that you wrote and, and we go through line by line and say, yeah, there's no bugs and no problems, you can still actually be inadvertently subject to a security problem based on modules that you import or even things that you don't even import. You know, if your application lands on a vulnerable host or inside a vulnerable container with a down level base image or something, uh, your application could still be rooted or hold or exploited. And, you know, it's nice to be able to say as a developer, well, that's not my problem. But, you know, in today's enterprise, it's, it's everybody's problem. Uh, it's as a developer, who's going to get called at two o'clock in the morning when the application has been rooted? Well, it's probably going to be me. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have to have an answer for that. So, you know, what are your thoughts there? Sure, I'd be happy to chime in on that. So first of all, I don't think that perfect code exists. I think that you know, for any any piece of uh, code that say above a thousand lines, I think it's um, you know theoretically impossible to verify its its correctness um, from a pure academic sense. From a practical sense, we know that pretty much all code has bugs. Every piece of software has bugs. There's a certain subset of bugs which can result in security vulnerabilities, and so I I think that it's just uh, you know, unrealistic to assume whether it's your own first party code or even third party stuff that you use or even libraries that you import, 
there is just no such thing as perfect code. And so once you adopt that, once you, once you, uh, you know, acknowledge that, uh, the question then becomes, okay, what, what, what are all the bugs that I could find out about? What are all the security bugs that I can find out about? And um, that, that's, it's, it's, I think it's very important to, to, to take that stance, to assume that there's no such thing as perfect code and rather put the focus on identifying and monitoring and detecting bugs as well as uh, security bugs. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think this slide is actually a great, uh, you know, talking, uh, provides some great talking points. You know, first of all, if you think of continuous observability in the context of your DevOps pipeline, the way to kind of summarize this slide is CI lets you build fast, CD lets you deploy fast, continuous testing lets you find functionality bugs fast, and continuous observability helps you find security and compliance issues fast. Basically, that's kind of the framework that we've laid out um, in the slide. And now there's, uh, Neil, um, if, if you were giving, uh, you know, advice to, uh, to an organization that is looking to implement DevSecOps right now from the start, um, you know, uh, there, there's this, you know, there's this talk about uh, that, that the slide uh, talks about is there's, there's two personas that are essentially interested in, in, uh, uh, in, in that DevSecOps initiative. One is the ops teams which care about securing the infrastructure, right? And those are the guys that use the current set of tools, you know, container security tools that find if your Kubernetes is configured right, if your Docker is configured right and whatnot. And these are the guys that are trying to shift left because they want to find these configuration issues ahead of time so that they can configure their production appliance properly. From a dev perspective, they don't care about whether your Kubernetes is configured right or not to be, you know, for the most part, because they care about whether their application, which is their code and the third party that bring in, they bring in, is that behaving properly? Uh, it, does that have any vulnerabilities known or unknown? That is, so securing the source becomes more important with the dev team. So in that case, the dev teams care about starting left, not even shifting left, right? So uh, could you double click on that a bit? Sure. So first of all, I, I, I'm really glad that you mentioned a uh, distinction between continuous integration and continuous testing and continuous delivery. While, you know, CICD is a very popular uh, term these days, uh, there is something that's missing. Maybe it should be CI, CT, CD. If you don't have the CT, the continuous testing in the middle, um, then effectively you could just be integrating bugs and deploying them. So uh, that is that is super super critical. I think the other thing that you mentioned that I think was interesting to build on is that um, the you know using using frameworks that can help uh, generate the right behavior all the time. Uh, th there's just no substitute for that because you, you want to have as as many as much automated detection of security issues as uh, possible. And I think that. There's a, a very critical cost argument here because if there are security bugs that get identified in production or even like just before something's about to launch, let's say that's when you did a pen test or whatever, the cost of fixing that is much more expensive than if you can identify it early in the dev and test phases pre-prod and the, the, the fix can be done there uh, without, um, you know, even involving as many people. The second that something's kind of in production, uh, you've got to have a, at least a, a mini security incident response for each and every kind of issue thing that comes up, whether it's reported by an external bug bounty person or a pen test team or whatnot. So I think that uh, shifting left is important for, for everybody because of the fact that it's much more efficient to fix bugs earlier in the life cycle rather than later. Cool. So let's jump in now to the guts and bones of Deep Factor. Mike, why don't you take us through a demonstration of the product for the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, where, uh, you know, show us what it's like to find issues, security and compliance issues in a running car, as opposed to a parked car, which is what the code scanning tools and, and other uh, image scanning tools allow you to do. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So Mike, you can share your screen to do the demo. All right. I uh, just want to make sure, can you guys see what I'm showing here? Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, what we built at Deep Factor is an observability platform, and it primarily consists of two pieces, the management portal and an analytics engine, which is what you're looking at here, and also the piece of code that runs inside the application, which I'll talk about in just a minute. 
So for the purposes of this demo, I've set up two applications that we've um, instrumented for observability. Uh, the first is a C-based, essentially CGI style of application that lives on the web and serves web requests called MathApp. Uh, the second is just the old uh, traditional Java pet store application that everybody who's done software development in Java in the past 20 years has seen. So I'll first focus on the pet store application and talk a little bit about um, what types of insights you're like, you're, you're, you can see with P-Factor. But before I get into that, I just want to quickly show how easy it is to, to create these instrumented applications. So when I talk about an application uh, in the context of P-Factor, it's not just code that you wrote. You can actually uh, run under observability all the other pieces of your application, including things that you, even, you didn't even write. So for example, if your application consisted of um, a front end Nginx or Apache web server, you can observe that and you can see what behaviors it's, it, it is exhibiting. You can look at your databases, your Postgres, your MySQL, whatever you happen to have, as well as all the code that you wrote. So those are what we call in deep factor terminology components. So each of these application cards you're looking at right here might have multiple components underneath. In this particular example, there's only one component in each of these, but you can have as many as you like. So the real quick way that you instrument and uh, uh, run your code under deep factor observability is click this button here. And I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, uh, all the commands here. I just wanted to show real quickly that in both the Kubernetes based uh, application style of performance. If you're apps using Kubernetes, you follow these instructions. Docker, you follow these instructions and just playing Docker without Kubernetes. And in a non-containerized or just you know, running your app in a VM, uh, you only have to run one command. It's basically you just run dfctl, which is a package that you install from us. And you just give it some parameters and you just give it the name of the thing you wanna run. So in the case of just running your application in a VM, you just say dash dash command and whatever command you'd normally run to test your app. If you run it with DFCTL run, you're gonna get the instrumented and observed version. For Docker, there's just a different command that says Docker run instead of uh, just run with the command. And then Kubernetes has a, a, an admission webhook that you drop into your environment and then that'll give you the ability to, uh, to instrument any Kubernetes based app. So we've intentionally tried to make this really, really simple uh, it's just one line, one command uh, to, to instrument and render out. Now, the important thing to mention is that in both of these applications that I'll show you, we have not changed a single line of code. So this is just the Java pet store app I cloned from GitHub and math app is something that one of our, um, uh, one of our engineers wrote just to demonstrate what, what we do in the product. But fundamentally, these are unmodified applications. So let's take a quick peek at uh, the pet store app. Now the pet store app lives inside uh, a Wildfly application server, which is essentially just like a Tomcat application server. And uh, what we're looking at here is kind of the, the highest level dashboard of the types of um, the types of insights that you'd see if you observe this application while it's running. So I've run this application with one of those DFCTL run commands earlier. And what that actually did is it launched Wildfly and it inserted the deep factor observability platform inside the processes address space. And what that means is we can observe over, I think something like 250 different APIs that this application may be doing. Now, of course, this is a Java application. So what we're really looking at is what is the interpreter doing? And then as we look at what the interpreter doing, we can also discern what the application itself is doing. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So we look at over 250 different APIs. These are APIs that live in libraries. Uh, and these are also system calls as well. So we can look at both based on where we are in this application. This gives us the ability to have what I like to say more semantic understanding of what the application is doing when it generates one of these security alerts. So is the application calling uh, an S3 Amazon AWS library to open some bucket? We'll actually know that it's doing that rather than some other uh, types of observability products that just simply give you a stream of system calls. You know, they say, oh, the application did an open and open, a read, a write, a close, and a connect and a listen, and then another read and write. Well, that's great, but you really don't understand without having that higher level of understanding that that sequence of operations is actually one higher level operation. Like, for example, your application used a, a payment gateway or something. That, that's the kinds of things that we'll be able to see. So this is the high level dashboard. And as you can see on the left, uh, we've actually broken our uh, security insights into really kind of four areas. Code execution risks. 
which are things like you used an API you shouldn't be using. AppSec compliance, meaning you violated a, a, a principle or a, or, or a rule that your, that your AppSec team has set for you, like you connected to an IP address you shouldn't have or a, or a country you shouldn't have, for example. OWASP-based vulnerabilities, which are, of course, you know, web scan-induced vulnerabilities, so things like SQL injection and uh, CSRF uh, vulnerabilities and whatnot. And vulnerable dependencies, meaning your application pulled in a jar file or a .so library or something that has known CVEs associated with it. So we break it down into those four categories. So I'll click over here on the Wildfly component and uh, talk a little bit about the types of insights that, that we look at and the types of insights we see. So again, based on the fact that we're looking at like 250 different uh, observability points in the application, what we can tell you are things about the internal workings of the application. So just real quickly up here in the upper left, we've got how many outbound network connections were made, how many inbound connections were made, uh, the rate and how many connections were made per second, how many files were opened, read write size, memory usage, CPU utilization, all that good stuff that you would normally get out of a regular application monitoring system. We give you that as well. Down at the bottom here, we've actually got essentially a report card for the security health of your application. And again, it's broken into those, uh, into those, four, uh, those four areas I discussed earlier, OWASP, AppSec policy violations, execution risk, code execution risk, and vulnerable dependencies. One thing we don't show on the top level dashboard, which you'll see here, is we actually give you some performance insights as well. While not strictly security issues, we do tell you, for example, if you're opening the same file over and over again, maybe you could optimize that by opening one handle and reusing it these kinds of things. Now up here, I've got a list of security alerts, and these are uh, behavioral insights that our backend has categorized and said, okay, this looks like something suspicious that you might want to look at. We're not saying that every single thing on this list is absolutely a security hole, but what we're saying is, you know, based on previous experience and based on what OWASP is saying and based on the fact that, you know, a library has a CVE, this is a, a risk area for your application. So I'm going to click on view all over here and show the list of these uh, sorted all through. And, and Mike, this risk could exist in, uh, it, in your code. It could be in third party right. code. It could be even in the interpreter, right? Java itself could have some issues that you catch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we're going to show you that in just a second here. That's a good point. So we do, we do block these into basically two big categories. We have security problems and performance related issues. And if I just click on one of these, for example, I don't know here, an unsafe string API was being used. I'll pick this one as an example for a code execution risk. Basically what we're doing here is we're flagging the fact that your application that you used has used an unbounded or unbuffered, uh, unbounded uh, string buffer operation. So generally speaking, you know, you probably shouldn't be using stir copy anymore. That's, that's known to be the source of many different memory uh, memory security vulnerabilities, uh, buffer overflows and whatnot. And what this says is that the, the observability platform has observed that the shell actually uh, with process ID 2211 actually had this, had this problem in it. Now over here, you see a stack trace of exactly where it occurred. And I don't have the debug symbols for shell, but if I did, I could actually see line numbers here. And I'll show you an example of that in a different alert in just a moment. The idea here is that it points you to exactly the line of code that's causing the problem. Now, of course, my application was the Java pet store. You know, why is shell being flagged here? You know, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting, right? Well, as I started up the application, I actually launched a shell script, which launched the Java interpreter, which did some other stuff, which who knows, may, maybe did a, a process.exec of another shell, right? The, the point here is that we watched the entire process tree of the application, not just Java, right? And again, this goes to the, the, the statement I made earlier that, you know, in the middle of the night when the application is being owned, it doesn't matter where it's being owned. If there's a problem in your app, you know, in air quotes, all the components that, that make it up, you have to be aware of that. Now, as a developer, could I fix this shell problem? I don't know, maybe, but it's probably something I just want to report upstream or maybe use an alternative or something like that. But the idea here is that we're showing you all of these, all of these behaviors. Let me and, pick and a different you can go into the process tree as well, right, to see the... Right, yeah, I'll show that in a second in a different alert. Yeah, but you're right. All right, so let's take another one here. How about um, library not owned by any OS package was loaded during run? So this is an, a, an example of an AppSec team policy violation. So you know, generally speaking, it's, it's 
good practice to make sure that if your application needs a library, that you're loading it from a trusted source, right? And it's either an application library that's loaded from the operating system, who's presumably the distributions vendor you trust, uh, or it's packaged as part of your application, in which case it should be you know, packaged and signed and checksumed and everything. What this alert is saying is that something has happened where the application, in this case, Java, has loaded a library and that library actually isn't owned by any package from the operating system. So this might be an example of somebody who's just untarred a big blob of files into the OS and, uh, and, executed, um, and executed some code from that. And here's an example of a stack trace that's more fully annotated, like I said earlier. In this scenario, we've got all the way starting at the top of the stack, which is you know, inverted here because that's the lowest frame, all the way from you know, the, the JBoss or Tomcat application server in this case, going all the way down into the interpreter uh, with line numbers and everything, and then ultimately resulting in the interpreter loading one of these libraries. Now, as Kieran mentioned, if I wanna know how did this happen, I can click on the process ID here and it will show me actually the process tree of the, of the application structure itself. So in this case, as we looked earlier, we had a shell script that launched Java, which launched a different Java and a third Java. So it's launching lots of different applications. We actually show you in here how many threads are running, the process name, the user ID, CPU affinity, and all, and all this business as well. So if your process was a little bit more complicated, you would actually see who launched what, and you could trace that back to figure out exactly where that came from. Take a look at how do I remedy this issue, Mike? If uh, you know when when I see this alert. All right, let's go back in. That's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's say, for example, that I looked at this and I go, you know, that that's really not a problem. That's a library that I own, and I I, I know that that's been for me that's been uh, totally vetted by my security team. So I don't want to see this anymore. All of our alerts have a reported, acknowledged, or you know, I don't care about this state. Not an issue. So what I can say is I can say this is not an issue. And if I click this here, what happens in the previous screen is this alert goes all the way to the bottom of the list and you kind of just forget about it. Or I can say, you know, actually this is a library that's, that should be tracked and packaged and monitored and checksumed and whatnot. So I'm gonna go ahead and acknowledge that. And if I want to, I can come down here as a user and I can add a comment. So I can say, you know, this needs to be looked at. And I can save that and then it annotates it with my name and that can be tracked by my security team. And if this is actually a bug in my code that I've identified by looking at the stack trace, I can actually go over here and click on this button, which is a link to JIRA. So we have integrations with JIRA, GitHub, uh, CircleCI, uh, Slack, and a bunch of other uh, tools that allow you to, to automatically integrate this into your developer workflow. So if I click this button here, I don't have this set up, but it would take me to JIRA and it would actually summarize everything you're seeing on this screen and file a ticket. And then that could be assigned to a developer at my organization. Does that answer that, Kieran? Yeah. And, yeah. and when looking through these kinds of issues, Neil, uh, is it typically the AppSec team that triages these and then passes it on, passes the subset of issues to developers or uh, would engineering team be using this kind of tool directly to triage the issues or does it depend on the organization? You're on, you may be on mute. Uh, Ah, okay, I'm now off of mute. Yeah, so I think that it depends on the organization. Yeah. Um, I think also things work most scalably when developers can, uh, you know, just uh, have the utmost responsibility for security as well and triage, uh, you know, their own issues and then ask the AppSec team if they uh, would like would like help. So I think that um, you know it can, it can be very tempting to you know just uh, say something's uh, not an issue, but it may be a good idea to check in with the AppSec team to see whether or not they think it's an issue, and uh, they may be able to recommend ways to fix it or ways to address it more systematically uh, than than just dealing with it with just that one instance. Yeah. So uh, overall, it depends on the organization, uh, but, there's, but there's multiple models which can be uh, you know, both scalable and secure. Yeah, because as far as the attacker is concerned, he or she's not gonna care whether the uh, exploit or the vulnerability uh, uh, you know, lies in your code or the third party code or Java, it, it's, it, 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 an exploit is an exploit. 
right? That's right. The attacker is just looking for one exploit to take advantage to yeah. get their initial foothold uh, into an application or into an organization. And uh, once they're once they're in initially, then they can uh, see what additional mischief they can do. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, as defenders, you know, we have the more challenging problem of having to try to close as many high priority holes as possible s to prevent the attackers from, you know, getting that one foot in the door. Yeah. Right. So there's a few other areas I'd like to show you guys. Um, the first is, of course, our, our OWASP related um, insights. And the inside our product, which I'll show you shortly, we, we package a headless OWASP Zap scanner. So we actually show you all of the all of the reports that um, that Zap would reply uh, or will provide you. So not only do we show you um, the type of the type of vulnerability or the type of exploits, we actually give you the evidence that are that is needed to um, to be able to replay this attack, to be able to look at what line of code is causing the attack. And and what sets us apart from some of some other products out there is that remember we're 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 running Zap, but what we're doing is we're we're essentially attacking the application from outside while being observing inside the program and actually telling you what is occurring as these attacks are going on. So for example, I can click here and I can see the stack trace to see what, what, what part of the application was exercised during that, uh, during that particular exploit. So it's not just a, a, a zap and here's the report, it's a zap and here's the report and here's all of the things that your application did during that, during that time. Now to facilitate this, I'll, I'll come back to this um, alerts here in just a second. To facilitate this, what we do, again, remember where we are inside the application, we're monitoring what the application is doing. So as soon as the application opens a socket and listens to that socket for incoming requests, what we're passively doing is monitoring the types of transactions that are going on in that socket, or in other words, types of, the type of data that's being exchanged. And if we see something that is uh, that looks like a URL or a URI or an HTTP request, what we do is we log that inside our product. So when I ran this test a few days ago, I clicked on a few, uh, a few links inside my application and the observability platform noticed that six URIs had actually been submitted. So if I click here on this, I can actually see which URIs had been, had been, uh, had been requested. So I requested, you know, slash application pet store and that translated into an HTTP request, HTTP get slash application pet store. We saw that, and what we do is we compile that list internally inside the management platform. And then what this allows you to do later is to go and say, I would like to initiate a web scan against these URIs. So if I click on start web scan here, I'm not gonna actually do it this time, but I'll show you what the, what the, what the wizard looks like. What we can do is we can actually scan against the things that we've, de that we've detected. So I didn't have to enter any of this. This was automatically populated. We noticed that the application opened a listening socket on port 8080 received some URI requests, HTTP transactions, and we log those in those six that we saw earlier. So I'm gonna just scan that existing service. Now, if I didn't wanna do that, if I actually had my application deployed somewhere already, I could just enter a custom URL and we would just go out and scan that. That's um, just a way of scanning if you don't wanna, um, if, if you don't wanna first start with a, a, the observability piece. And this so scan is powered by OWASP Zap. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, so down here, I can do an API scan if I have like a Swagger document that I want to upload or an open, a open API doc I want to upload to the portal. And that will give uh, the scanning engine a good place to start from with respect to all the URIs it can, it can, it can crawl from. Um, three levels of scan, uh, of scan thoroughness, uh, quick, standard, or thorough. Um, we, we, we try to make it take just a few minutes with the quick scan. The scan, standard scan may take a little bit longer depending on how many URIs you have, of course. And, and then Thorough really you know, throws the book at the application. It tries all sorts of, all sorts of ways to exploit it. Uh, this is whether or not I want to include the URIs that I, that I showed you earlier. If I don't, we'll just do a standard that scan, which kind of does its own web crawl. And then uh, I can also supply uh, authentication tokens. I can supply um, log on log off scripts and everything else necessary to exercise the application. So I would just click none if I was using a plain uh, HTTP application or, or, or whatnot. Okay. If I start the scan, then I get the report and it generates the alerts that, that you've already seen. Got it. So basically so the factor is like a combination right. of, uh, it's observability, which is looking what's happening inside your app in every thread, every process. 
right. the same time, you can also click a button to run a scan, which is poking the app from the outside. So it's like you have DAST and observability in one simple. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we've, we've tried to make it as seamless as possible. You don't have to run any commands. You just click a few buttons in the UI. Yeah. So the everything last, for runtime yeah. visibility, basically. Right. The last, the last section I'll talk about uh, from the four that I described earlier, the four security observability sections is uh, vulnerable dependencies. So this is basically telling us that there's been some CVEs associated with some of these, uh, uh, with, with some of these components that I've loaded. So glibc is down level on this, on this machine, for example. And this has uh, greater than, uh, greater than a five on the CVSS store for that CVE. So it tells us what version I have and whether or not I need to upgrade those. Right, so I'm not, and, and just to clarify, we're not looking at all the vulnerabilities in your build artifacts, we're looking at which vulnerable component was actually right. loaded at your, by your application at runtime. Right, right. Okay. right. Now, switching gears a little bit, there's two more things I wanna talk about in the demo. One, one, thing, um, one thing we frequently are asked is, you know, hey, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Java developer, I'm a Node.js developer, I'm a Python developer, I really don't care what's going on, you know, way down in the library level of my interpreter. How can I turn off some of these alerts to reduce the amount of uh, verbosity that I get? And uh, up here at the top, we have alert policies, which allow you to specify which policy that you would like. In other words, which alerts are you interested in seeing and which ones are not relevant to you? By default, we have the max alert policy turned on, which just says, you know, alert on everything. But if you don't like that, we've got some pre, uh, pre-built um, policies that are reduced in scope for different kinds of environments. Um, so, for example, if you're really certain that, you, that you're not interested in knowing what the interpreter is doing or whether or not there's vulnerabilities there, you can select the interpreted language policy, which has some of these knobs turned off, or compiled languages or, or whatnot. Or if you don't like any of these, you can actually clone whichever one you'd like to start from and create your own policy. So that's what I've done here. I'm not going to go through every single one of these. We've got different kinds of uh, on-off switches for all the alerts that we show. So AppSec policy violations, code execution risks have their own... Uh, uh, policies uh, enabled or enableable or disableable, vulnerable dependencies allow you to change that five CVSS score we talked about earlier. If, if you'd like the threshold to be higher, you can crank this up and, and, and whatnot. Um, some of the things that we haven't shown, um, we allow you to, 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 to opt in, opt out to uh, firing alerts for connections made to or from specific geographies. Um, Alert if there's debug or sensitive environment variables found, like if you find AWS keys in the environment, is that actually legitimate or not? Uh, executing programs from suspicious paths, loading programs from suspicious paths, loading libraries from suspicious paths, all these things are all configurable. Um, we also have an API that's available. So we're entirely REST and HTTPS driven. So you can actually look at our API and if you don't want to use our dashboard for whatever reason, you can actually use the API and we give you a way to come in and actually um, see the API for every piece of our product. So you can consume these uh, events and alerts in a different dashboard if you'd like to do that as well. So this is observability as code, just like right. infrastructure as code allows you to spin up infra as part of your DevOps scripts. You could do observability right. as code to do this as part of your CI pipeline. Right, yeah, and that's all documented here. It's also available as a Swagger doc that you can consume in whatever kind of tooling that you want to consume it as. And, and you can also use this as a gate to uh, to get your builds if you like. Right. right. Yeah. One one other one other thing I'd like to show back here is if I dig into the components again, is some of the other um, some of the other leaves over here on the left hand side. Um, we have we ha we can actually tell you what what happened between your builds. Now I only have one build of this uh, particular. Um, application. But if I had multiple builds, you'd see them listed here. And what actually happens is I can then look at which build changed over time. So I can say, you know, the build from yesterday had fewer uh, security issues or alerts than the one from today. So, you know, what did I change? And I can go back and figure that out. So I've got, I can, we track builds. And by the way, if you're using, uh, if you're using uh, uh, Jenkins or any other automated build system, we'll pick up the build ID from the environments that you're building in. And instead of just saying, manual build here, you'd actually have a build version or a build number that makes sense to you in your environment. So we pick that up automatically. I wasn't doing that for this demo. I just ran it from the command line. So that's why it just says it's a manual build here. We keep track of all the nodes where this application is running. So this would be the VMs or containers or pods where the application is running. And we give you information about 
uh, the OS version and whatnot, and whichever hypervisor or cloud service provider you're running in, we give you that as well. We've talked about um, uh, instances and web services. We actually have the ability to show you all the network connections as well. So how many inbound and outbound connections and the protocols and which port that they're, uh, that they're active on. All the DNS lookups performed by, uh, by the application rate of incoming and outgoing connections. These graphs aren't really that interesting to look at for this application because I, I didn't run it for very long. But over time, you'll be able to see minim minimum, maximum, and average rates of connections. All the dependencies loaded by the applications, and that includes, since it's a Java app, all the jars loaded, as well as all the shared objects loaded by the interpreter and how many times they were loaded here. And you can see we've actually got over here in this side, we got 499 different jars that were loaded. So this is a pretty wow. yeah. good sized application, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump down here to file system. We actually show you all the files that, files that have been accessed, how many file handles were opened, and a file system tree giving you uh, a list of everything that was opened and when I can click on this and find information about uh, the files that were accessed and, and when. This gives me all sorts of information about what the application is doing. Now, we're, we're digging down pretty far down the rabbit hole here, but the, the, the reason I'm talking about this is we like to give the developer all of the all of the, the information necessary to be able, be able to go fix any of these issues that have been, that have been seen. Okay. Last but not least in the demo, I always like to stop with the live stream. The live stream is interesting because it actually shows you all of the inbound events that are coming in from the application. And depending on the size of the application, uh, uh, you, you can see a lot of these events. So some of these events are uh, what we call heartbeat events, which just basically tell which files are opened and how much CPU is being used in memory and whatnot. But there's also file events and network events and URI events and everything else that are coming in from time to time. So this application is generating events continually. And for some of our larger customers, uh, you might generate 100 million events in a day and we'll consume all those. And then, of course, the next question that I usually get asked when I say that you've got 100 million events a day is, wow, that must be a huge overhead, right? You know, you're, you're sitting in the path of 250 different APIs. Well, really, what our what our runtime part of the of the product does, that's the part that lives inside the app, is it only just gathers information about the parameters of which API you're using. All of these insights and all of this analysis is all done in the back end in the cloud. So the only thing that the that the that the that's being sent from the runtime piece of the product to the back end is just a you know you call to open and here's the file name or something like that. So it's it's a very short, uh, small packet of data that gets sent. So the overhead is very, very low. Awesome. So Ken, yeah. I think that's kind of the whirlwind tour of the, of the, of the product. Anything else you want to see? No, that's, that's great. Neil, any, uh, any comments on the demo? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in that, that you know, when using uh, Deep Factor, you know, pre-prod, like th there isn't any, uh, you know, performance overhead that, that really matters, right? Because you're not running like in production. And so you can get observability and monitoring and all this data to help you understand right. what's what's going on, um, and then the second that you know you you found everything, you fixed everything, you launch it, uh, your application will continue to scream in production, and right. uh, you know you you get the you get the best performance without having to instrument anything in production. Right, and that, that's a great point because uh, you know we we are we're, we're kind of focused on that pre-production observability phase, but. We have customers saying, hey, you know, this is great. Can I just leave this on in production? Yeah, you certainly can. Uh, our performance is low enough where it actually doesn't really matter. But if it does matter to you and you want to turn us off in production, you just simply rerun the same build artifact without DF, the, that, one, that one line, DSCTL. Yeah. So the, the great news is you don't have to change your build and, you know, do a test and then rebuild and then move back to production. It's the same build artifact. It's just not being observed. Uh, but yeah, I, we, we've seen a lot of people say, hey, you know, this would be great. Can I use this in, in, in prod? Yeah, sure, you can. Yeah. Yeah. And one interesting thing to note is that, uh, Neil, uh, the user didn't have to do anything Java specific, even though the application was Java. The user, all he had to do, or he or she had to do, is just run DFCTL run my yeah. DFCTL run my container. And Deep Factor figures out that it's Java and then does some special things. By, like using a Java agent and things like that behind right. it. So it's completely language agnostic as far as the user is concerned. 
Yeah, I think that's great. I think that with the one line um, configuration change to get that observability and yeah. get it in a language independent fashion is, is great because th what that means then is even in your environment, you can have multiple components of your application that are written in different languages and you can still get the observability in an agnostic uh, language agnostic way. Yeah, cool. I know we're, so, we have, uh, yeah, so, we're yeah, so let's uh, heading up to the top of the hour. So I'll hand it back to you here and I'll stop my sharing now. Cool. All right. Uh, let me uh, get back to the PowerPoint, uh, just a couple of slides and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. I know we don't have too much time for questions, but just to summarize, run one command. Doesn't matter if it's app is, if your app is Kubernetes or Docker or traditional non-containerized application, zero code changes to your app. Nothing, no changes to your build uh, statement. Just run this one command during test, during pre-prod, or even in canary deployment in your production. And you get rich visibility about what all things your application is up to. Collect the millions of events that are coming out of your application, reduce them to a handful of actionable insights that uh, convey security and compliance risk. So that's in a, in a nutshell what deep factor is. And if you think of trying to bake it into your CI pipeline, uh, you know, here's here's our recommendation for how to think about your CI pipeline. Uh, you know, you write your code, you test your, you find the risks in your code with your SAST, you create your builds, you find risks in your build artifacts using container image scanning or self recomposition tools. Up to this point, you're looking at a parked car, you're looking at static. Uh, but now, when you're testing, you turn on deep factor and you're looking at a running car uh, and identify all of the four modules of insights that Mike said. You know, code execution risks, runtime use of vulnerable dependencies, AppSec compliance, OWASP results and then you deploy in production. So that in a nutshell is what Deep Factor does for you. And um, for the first person to ask, I know we, we have a couple minutes left for questions. So for the first person to ask the question, we're, gonna, we're giving away Neil's good book, a, a free copy of Neil's book, uh, Big Breaches. It's a really good read. So uh, uh, let's open up uh, to the attendees for some questions. You can use the chat window to type in the questions. Okay, here's a question, uh, Mike. Is there, uh, what kind of insights does ZFactor find that static code analysis tools do not find? That's a good question. Um, static code analysis tools will find uh, issues in code that can be read by a machine or by a human. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't find behavioral based um, uh, insights that are based on actions that the application does. So uh, here's a good example. Uh, the example I showed earlier about the library being loaded, uh, that was actually due to the library loading libzip.so, right? So there was a shared object that was loaded by interacting with the application and looking at one of the, uh, one of the images in that application. What it did is the images were in a jar, which is a giant zip file. And what it did is it loaded libzip to unzip the jar, and that libzip wasn't actually part of the application to begin with. So in theory, that application loaded, an app, uh, loaded a library that wasn't being monitored by the system administrator. It loaded libzip from some random location in the file system. Um, so that would be an example of that. Um, there's nowhere in the code that said, you know, load libzip that a static analysis tool would, would be able to find. It was based on something that the interpreter did when it was opening a jar file. So again, behavioral-based insights is what uh, observability is all about. Got it. Uh, we're going to take one more question because we're um, we're out of time. Um, you know, I, I think our, the goodness of our technical demo uh, took obviously a lot more time, but but it was worth it. Um, so uh, one one of the question is, can I compare the behavior of different bills uh, with the tool? Yeah. Um, we call that drift-based analysis. You can actually look at one build versus another and see the uh, the alerts that I showed you earlier. Um, I only had one build and I had, um, uh, looking here on my screen, I had five P2s, three P3s, and one P4 severity issues. And all you would see is a second line underneath those builds and you would have different counts that you could then go and compare. Awesome. All right, so with that guys, I, I think we're a couple of minutes over already. So we're gonna stop the, uh, the questions. Any other questions, please feel free to reach out to DeFactor. Uh, hello at DeFactor.io. Uh, and for any questions, we're happy to uh, jump in and, uh, and answer them. Thank you so much, Neil and Mike, for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing to have these conversations. Thanks, Great, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank bye. you. Bye.